<laughs> Let's talk about the safety perspectives. Um, so um, and, uh, there's there are no disclosures over for the government. Don't get any money here. Um, the only disclosure that I might have, uh, as Wendy mentioned, I will talk a little bit on, on FDA's um, the impact, the, the, the impact of on FDA regulation on, on how we think about uh, our potential compound that we use in our in our in our, in our studies here. But I'm not representing the FDA here in any means, so 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 please keep that in mind. So the objectives of the um, um, next few minutes is to give a, a, as always, a short uh, a, a historical perspective on on what will uh, follow and what is led up to certain regulations in, in, in the non-clinical requirement field. Um, then we'll talk about um, our, kind of try to approach the question a little bit, are non-clinical studies required for my study, or should I care? Um, uh, and I will focus there a little bit on the, on the regulatory perspective. And if so, which part is relevant for my study? And we'll talk a little bit about those selection, uh, sorry, those selection mainly, and, and safety uh, monitoring from, from a non-clinical point of view. So, um, why is non-clinical safety testing relevant? Usually, um, it all uh, so often it started with a disaster, and uh, in that case, uh, it looked like this here: it's a, uh, a bottle of, of um, a substance that was labeled an exterior sulfonilamide. Basically, this was in the year 1937, where this disaster basically happened. And what happened is that sulfonilamide was a quite um, 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 novel and, and an potent antimicrobial agent, and it was founded by many pharmaceutical company, companies, but also by a small company um, um, uh, in, in Tennessee, and they used uh, diethylene uh, uh, glycol as a solvent, and they blended it with raspberry um, flavor to make it palatable. Um, at that time already, in the 30s, um, there were already some reports out there on, 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 on the solvents, uh, nephrotoxicity, but uh, it was not known uh, to the company's chemist at that time. So basically, this um, uh, compound was, was formulated with, um, with, with, with that uh, toxic uh, solvent, so it was not yet the compound, it was a solvent, um, and there were no pre, uh, required preclinical testings um, at that uh, time, so uh, essentially uh, over 100 people um, in 15 states died as a consequence of exposure to uh, um at that time. So that led to, um, to a publication basically in, in, in John Medley in 1938, and this is a little bit off here, um, so it should have shown the title here, but it's completely off here, sorry. Um, so this is basically co copied out of the publication, and um, what you can see here on the right, it's, um, uh, you will hopefully see the slides when, when, when you receive them. The, the, in, in that paper, uh, the summaries, uh, it was basically summarized the pathological effects of, 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 um, of, of that compound, and what the authors uh, basically came up with at the end of the paper, they, they, they created a list of nine requirements that they suggested that should be basically um, uh, examined and, and, and proven, shown, uh, before uh, a compound can be used in the first in human uh, treatments. And you can only see here starting number four, you have the right to shoot run all the way up until one, but what you can already see here, some recommendations are still relevant today. And this, well, these are um, uh, chronic toxicity studies, acute toxicity studies, um, careful frequent observations um, on multiple um, uh, species, uh, and, um, you know, several, several animals, careful uh, pathological examinations, and so forth. And basically, these recommendations were the basis for, uh, for Congress to basically uh, took that up, uh, picked that up, and um, uh, implement that into the Food and Drug, Food, Drug and Cosmetics Act of 1938. Um, and this first introduced the mandate um, of preclinical safety test, uh, testing um, uh, into FDA's authority uh, to review. And that requirement is, is um, So in this manner, this is still relevant up today. So when you submit your uh, IND, there's the form uh, FDA 1571 that you will get very accustomed to uh, when you conduct and maintain an IND study. And, um, and then this lines out the contents of the application. And uh, the uh, important part of this, we heard often the most uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the part with the largest volume, is the part on chemistry, manufacturing, and control, and pharmacology, and toxicology. So this was basically um, uh, started with, with, with that disaster in the 1930s, and, and it's relevant for us up until today. So what should you know 
about uh, uh, your drug um, independently whether you have to create that data or you have to submit it or you have to uh, be aware of that. So what is important to know, what, 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 what stands behind these two points, CMC, uh, chemistry, manufacturing and control, basically you need to know that the drug product is composed not only of your active drug substance, which I refer to as API active, pharmaceutical ingredient, but there are also excipients in that solvents, for example, there might be impurities in there, uh, and there's also the container. And uh, when you submit your uh, drug to the FDA, FDA really wants to know not only about, about, about your active drug substance, but also of these other um, compounds that might be a part of your, of, 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 of your final uh, drug. So you also need to uh, know about um, the identity, the strength, purity, and quality of, of your drug product and also additional information. The manufacturers, the drug, where is it stored, how do you store it, what's the stability, uh, etc. So that might be part of a, of a, of a so-called CMC um, package. Regarding pharmacology and toxicology, um, you should um, know or be aware of that, um, that, that you might need to uh, know about the pharmacological effect, the mechanisms and animal models, not only from a, from a, from a efficacy point of view, but also from a safety uh, point of view, and then there is this uh, ADME, or uh, uh, short for absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, uh, what you can get from animal data, basically, then toxicology. You can divide in acute, subacute, and chronic um, uh, toxicology data. Um, an example for what might be required for a phase one, first in human um, uh, dose escalation study, for example, single ascending dose study, let's put it that way, might be a repeated dose toxicology in two species, most common. Uh, rats and dogs, 14 to 28 days in compounds that have never been um, uh, used in humans before. So that might be required for, for a phase one study. Uh, additionally, um, safety pharmacology, uh, persistence such as cardiovascular, CMS specific pulmonary studies, etc. There might be special toxicology tests required based on um, your mode of administration, for example, dermatolic, uh, dermal toxicity. Etc. And you know there is a list of additional toxicology tests that might be required, might be necessary, either at the beginning or at least sometime during the uh, 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 drug development process, um, and so on. Um, we talk about preclinical here, and the title of the talk is, is, is to talk about preclinical. The, 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 we need to be aware that preclinical uh, implies in our um, drug development pipeline that basically the preclinical work is done once you move into your clinical trial. Because once you start your phase one trial, then you're done with preclinical. Uh, and that's true for certain aspects uh, of, of, of that. We talked about the CMC uh, for, for your phase one product. We talked about pharmacology, maybe acute toxicology. <coughs> However, um, there might be other non-clinical aspects that, that, that are relevant beyond your, your first human administration phase one. That might be an alternate formulation, for example. You might need to submit a different CMC package if you, if you, if you change um, uh, uh, the manufacturer, for example. Chronic toxicology studies are usually not required all the way in the beginning when you only submit it in a single ascending dose, uh, uh, for, for example. So if you then go into you know, a, a phase two or even a phase three trial, then when you submit for six months, nine months, additional chronic toxicology studies might be necessary. Reproductive toxicology even goes beyond approval sometimes. Um, uh, additional safety pharmacology. So basically, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that the, the term preclinical from a safety point of view is uh, might be a little bit misleading. And, and then at FDA, you actually get slapped get on your list when you use uh, the, the term preclinical in, in that perspective. So that's the politically correct term is non clinical for, um, for what we're talking about. And that's because the non clinical development goes all the way up um, uh, to, to your drug approval, even, even beyond that. So we have to be um, aware of that. Um, why does this post clinical, um, uh, non clinical aspect matter? Because um, it can jeopardize your, your clinical development. And uh, I give, I'm just, just pulled two, um, two uh, examples out of the literature is actually, uh, actually from Google, and you know, this is where you get your actual really information from, from press releases from companies these days, not in not a topic. So basically, this is a, an example of a recent um, uh, development um, uh, uh, in, a, in a development of an SMA drug of a, of a compound that's already in phase two. Um, 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 uh, um, with 64 patients, that basically was uh, halted by the company because it's hard to read here, but basically the press release states that um, uh, the long-term data from animal tests investigators ran into an eye finding. So that I uh, don't know exactly what's going on, but but the but, but the company basically put the uh, development of that compound um, on hold 
to try to find out what, what, what the reason for it is. So, so what you see is that even if this development often in parallel, non-clinical um, uh, uh, developments are going, going in parallel. Another example would be, would be this um, example. This is a study on a compound in Huntington's disease that was published um, this year in January. And a few weeks later, actually, um, the company um, uh, that is sponsoring this compound put out a press release that upon review, the FDA has issued a partial clinical hold um, letter based on non-clinical animal findings, um, in which, um, which basically limited the, the, the dose that they were able to administer in a plant phase three trial. And this basically they were limited to doses that were considered by the companies not, not the optimal dose. So, so this is constituted a partial clinical hold. So basically, the FDA told them you cannot go beyond dose X. So that was also something that came even after um, the phase uh, um, two study in tonight. So, so have, you have to be aware of that. It doesn't stop um, um, after after you start your first uh, your phase one uh, study. So why do we not why, why do we need non clinical farm tox data? We want to determine whether a drug is uh, safe um, to put uh, um, uh, uh, into human development to determine what constitutes an initial safe uh, dose for human clinical trials. And we go into that a little bit. Uh, we want to help to determine um, a safe stopping dose. I'm not going to talk about that too much. Um, we want to identify potential dose limiting, limiting toxicities. What can we learn from our clinical studies that we then want to monitor for uh, in clinical trials? And we want to also assess potential toxicities that cannot be identified in clinical trials. Um, non clinical uh, safety for IND, the regulatory view. So, when it comes back to your trial that you're, you're, you're developing, how does that impact your, uh, your, your trial? So it really depends on, on, on what you're doing. So let's say you use an off-the-shelf FDA-approved drug. So you can assume um, that the drug meets uh, animal toxicology standards for the maximum approved dose and length uh, of exposure per label. So the label is really in your friend, you go in, you have Basically, if you're, if you're within the label, then you can assume that that, that uh, FDA has seen and has reviewed uh, these data uh, before they approve that potential uh, drug. If you use a higher dose, if you use a different duration of administration, different formulation, different route of administration, um, other than this, if you divert from, from the label that uh, you know, might impose a higher risk, then it may be necessary that additional non clinical data. Um, uh, should be necessary to, to present to, to FDA to get, to get an approval here. If you use a combination, it might be necessary um, that you might be asked for potential interactions. Um, and um, for CMC, if you exactly use the, the, the compound off the shelf as it is marketed, usually the label should be sufficient in, in terms of uh, information that FDA requires. Let's say this is a non-approved drug, and um, we discussed that yesterday there was a case that uh, there's an intervention in the investigation of drug that is supplied by different sponsor. The best way is to get this other sponsor to, to send you a right of reference, a letter that allows um, uh, uh, basically a reference to another IND, so if you can go back and look, and, uh, look into the, 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 the non-clinical package. And this should support um, your plant dose and your route of administration. Dietary supplements, we, we, we touched upon that briefly, I don't go into detail. If you use a dietary su substance as a, as a drug, uh, just to medium to treat, mitigate, etc., uh, disease, then you know, the same standards apply for their dietary supplement. Um, if you have an investigational drug that you completely make yourself, then, um, uh, and there's no human experience, then you might be uh, required to uh, submit the full package um, as, as it is required. Um, how to pick a safe starting dose. And um, you might not need additional non-clinical information if there is, as I said, already an FDA-approved uh, dosing drug out there and it's in the dosing range. Um, look, at the, look at the label. You might um, get uh, necessary and uh, sufficient data from the literature or from any other study that is available to you to support your starting dose and support your dosing that you want to uh, achieve. That, that can be from animal studies, even better human studies usually it's already been administered to human that usually trumps animal studies. But you have to be aware that, that sometimes reports and publications uh, uh, should be specific in regards, in regards to safety. Sometimes you know, animal model data on efficacy models can be used. You know, there's no report on many adverse events, so I assume that it's safe. You cannot really assume uh, that it's safe unless it's really specifically stated in the study that it was looked that safety was you know, one, of their, one of their outcome. Uh, measures in the non-clinical trial. Ideally, is that you obtain the data sets from 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 wherever author uh, that that study. Um, 
If there's uh, no human pre uh, previous experience, um, then there is um, a way to estimate your safe starting dose based on non clinical data. And I'm referring uh, to this uh, guidance uh, to industry. Usually, this guidance, we have guidance, is not regulation, so this is just a guidance. It's a, it's, a, it's a recommendation, it's not the law, so you can use it to help you, uh, but, it's, uh, uh, um, but it's not you know, required. But this, this one is a particularly helpful one uh, when you want to get a broad range about whether you're good in your nose range or, or, or whether you're, you're a little bit off. And um, uh, I have the link down here. Let me just briefly guide you through that guidance because this is a really practical guidance. Basically, FDA is, is recommending you to, uh, the assessment of uh, five steps. First is to, to define noise, low no observed adverse effect level. Um, second would be to calculate the human equivalent dose. Third, you should um, uh, select the most appropriate species. Then you apply a safety factor. And then um, there's a pharmacologically active dose determination as well. So what is the NOAA? This is an important term here to learn. So, so the no uh, observed adverse effects level, that's the first step to determine uh, the maximum recommended starting dose. And, um, and, and you use your available animal data to, to calculate uh, this uh, uh, no observed uh, adverse effect uh, level. And that's usually a benchmark for safety um, when you write from appropriate uh, animal studies. And the definition is this is the highest dose level that does not produce any significant increase in adverse effects in comparison to the control group. So uh, you're looking for adverse events here that are biologically significant for your particular um, uh, uh, disease that you're that, that uh, you're you're studying. So that's basically the NOAA. The next step is um, you uh, you generate and you calculate a human equivalence uh, dose from the animal into the human. Um, uh, often. Um, uh, this dose is normalized by body surface area. This scales well between animals and humans, but often in animal studies you have milligram per kilogram uh, uh, units, and uh, this is a very nice table that's from that guidance, and I use that myself to get a rough estimate where I am with my proposed starting dose. These are, these are suggested uh, conversion factors from, from an animal species into a human to, to, to convert uh, milligram per kilogram from, let's say, a dog or, or a rat into, in, in, into a human dose. Next step is species selection. You saw before that sometimes there are two species required for, for, for a completely new administration to humans of a new compound. So what do you select if you have different human equivalent doses between different species? Um, factors to consider, pharmacological factors, um, factors which animal model is, is, is best predictive. For biologics, it's a little bit different because the animal might not you know, express that receptor that you're specifically looking at, and you might not see any adverse uh, effects in, in, in animals for, for biologics. So we leave the biologics a little bit aside. In absence of any data on, on, on species relevance, it's always safe to go for the lowest human equivalent dose. Um, the next is the safety factor. Um, the goal is to provide a margin of safety for protection of human subjects receiving the initial clinical dose. So there's only so much we can infer from animal data, so this is basically a rule of thumb that's a safety factor that, that we apply that accounts for certain answer, for, for uncertainties, different sensitivities, etc. Um, the default safety factor recommended in that guidance from the FDA is 10. So always take the human equivalent dose divided by 10, then this is basically if you follow their, 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 their recommendations. This, uh, this, this is the default standards. There are reasons to increase that factor. For example, if the, the toxicities are severe, are you irreversible, irreversible if they're not monitorable, etc. There are reasons for decreasing the factor. For example, if it's a well-known class uh, that, uh, that, that, that you're um, using. So again, there's you know, room to, you know, to argue, to consider. This is, again, this is a guidance. Um, the pharmacolo pharmacolo ph pharmacologically active dose is um, basically the lowest dose that is tested in an animal species with an intended pharmacological activity. So this goes a little bit already into your, into your efficacy um, uh, model. It's typically also derived from appropriate uh, models. Once the maximum recommended safe starting dose is determined, you should compare it to the human equivalent dose um, of the pharmacologically active dose. So that's a more pharmacodynamic uh, marker. If needed, if this pharmacologically uh, uh, active dose lower than your um, you know, calculated dose based on toxicity, you might want to adjust uh, that dose. Um, let's just briefly go for an example. Let's say you have non-clinical toxicology studies, and you determined um, that you have you know, three studies. You have uh, the NOAA L is 50 milligrams per dogs, 50 milligrams per, per kg in rats, and 50 
monkeys, so your next step is, uh, so that's first step, step, step two is conversion to a human equivalent dose. You use the table with the conversion factors because you receive the dose in, in milligram per kilogram, and you, you, you divide that, there's a uh, you know, method to multiply or divide it, we go for the division method, so you have these factors, these conversion factors of 1.8 in the dog, 6.2 in the rat, 3.1 on the market, you can all look that up in the table. So you, you end up with three different human equivalent doses, 8, 8, and 16 milligram per kilogram. If we don't have any information about the relevance of the appropriateness of these models, we go for the lowest one, so the human equivalent dose would be 8 milligram per kilogram, and you would apply safety factors, so our maximum recommended start to safe starting dose um, per FDA guidance would be 0 0.8 milligram per kilogram. Uh, this is usually a good method to get a broad sense of where you are in terms of your first um, uh, dose. Be aware that this guidance is guidance for phase one in basically in healthy volunteers. This is what FDA recommended. So, so, so when you do your you know, first DPCs, phase two A might be a little bit different, um, but um, uh, yeah, it's uh, if you have if there's no human experience, you don't go directly into patients. No, that's still still a good good idea to say where where's your safety where are your safety margins etc. When you when you submit your IP. there are certain limitations. Certainly, these algorithms uh, the algorithm can be too mechanical. It's toxicity focused. This pharmacology based does not express dose escalation. It does not uh, apply to any locally administered drugs, and it's not fully applicable to biologics, as I said before, because because biologics are usually very very targeted towards um, human individuals, for example. Uh, and an, an alternative, and I just throw out that, that, that term is MABEL, the minimum anticipated biologic effect level, and there's literature on that, and just showing that graph. So that's basically uh, a, a level that is determined from a pharmacodynamic uh, response in the animal, not from the toxicity uh, uh, level point of view. So that's, um, you know, it takes, takes pharmacodynamic aspects into account. Um, the last point that I want to make is, apart from the safe starting dose, uh, what uh, other implications do these non-clinical data um, or, or studies have, basically for the clinical safety monitoring, any safety signal observed in your non-clinical studies, you should monitor for uh, clinic, clinically be vigilant about the unknown. So uh, animal models are only you know, uh, good to a certain extent. There's literature on that that's basically showing that um, the positive concordance rate, basically sensitivity between observed animal and human toxicity lies about by 70%. So therefore, 30% of human toxicities are not uh, uh, predicted. And you can break that down into certain um, uh, uh, areas of, of, of adverse events. And here on top, um, you see the ones that uh, we, we don't usually use or a hard time to pick up uh, in animals that would be cramps, sweating, dry mouth headache, dizziness, etc. There are others, for example, in the middle, gastrointestinal vomiting, where animal models are good predictive, and down the list of uh, 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 symptoms, uh, convulsions, ataxia, for example, where, according to that review, animal models seem to be over uh, predictive here. In terms of uh, species uh, uh, difference, um, it seems that dogs um, are more predictive in terms of their observed toxicities than, than mice, for example. So um, that's also something to, to, to be aware of, how predictive uh, is that data. So let me uh, summarize if human data la is lacking. Uh, Non-clinical safety data is crucial for dose selection, for safety monitoring, and also basically to meet your regulatory requirements to move forward into your first in human uh, trial. Uh, human data often trumps non-clinical data. If you have that, that's always good. Uh, Non-clinical, that helps you, for example, for, for dietary supplements. If there's no okay, non-clinical data, but you can show that you know, there's, there's, there's great human exposure that might be helpful. Non-clinical experiments are usually expensive. That's something to keep in mind. It's unlikely that anybody of you will conduct those trials themselves. But, 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 but if FDA comes back and encourages the study for you, it's kind of, kind of throw your budget off. Um, usually, no need to worry. A certain caveat if your compound is uh, FDA approved and used within the limitations of the label. With that, I say thank you and um, okay, any questions together with one. Yeah, let me point out a little, a little advertisement here um, on, on a clinical trials fellowship that we're offering at NIH together <coughs> with the FDA, so that might be something interesting. And, um, and that. Thanks. So we're running a little bit behind, but we have 10 questions, so we'll just run into the break as long as Steve doesn't mind going into a few more minutes. So anybody have any questions for Wendy or Dietrich? Don't start saying. 
Um, so one thing I think I think at the scientists it's very important to have uh, replication of research findings. Um, but it seems like we're proposing to replicate research findings in a grant application is not a winning strategy. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> I think the hope is that if there were to be something that had not been replicated, that that may be a concern. So within the application itself, the expectation would be that you'd be planning to do the replication study. If there were no replication study, I think you know you'd have to justify sort of the strength of, of your rationale for why you think you proceed with there just being one study that demonstrates something they have to see in a model. Oftentimes, as you know, there'd be you know multiple lines of evidence in support of it, but I think it's just that because things have not been able to be reproduced, that there's just more emphasis on it. This is all new, so I think it's a little bit hard to predict exactly where it's going to go. Um, but there's just a lot of attention on this topic right now. But I, I agree, it's going to be something no one's going to get you know brownie points for publishing something that confirms somebody else's major finding, and it's going to cost a lot of money. And so those are things that people are aware of. Um, and I think just sort of being aware that this is you know, coming down the pipe, hopefully it's helpful. Well, as far as I know, sometimes if, if, if you get basically thrown off of the clinical development by some missing um, not clinical uh, uh, pieces, there are some translational um, uh, mechanisms in place where you can basically come with your old letter from the FDA and say this and this and that is required. And if you make Transition point. It might be a different funding mechanism, but but to say there's actually mechanisms in place to actually FDA and then actually actually really looking after then you know within these grant mechanisms to to to, to do these replication studies. So so I'm actually very excited about the the, the rigor movement, and uh, I hope this is an opportunity to actually also try to bridge this gulf between preclinical and clinical trials where there's usually not a lot of communication between those two research communities. Um, and you know, I've often said that trans, you know, translation, in my mind, often fails because, both because the preclinical world doesn't do some of the, doesn't model some of the clinical trials that we ultimately need to do, and because the clinicians never read the animal trials that would actually inform their work. And so it's sort of a bi-directional failure. Um, so, uh, as very important as it is, I think this culture change is going to be hard to, to, to do, and I hope that that's what all of this movement is moving toward. And I wonder, in the basis of the clinical trials course, how we fit into that. Um, because a lot of designing better preclinical animal experiments is not the same as basic science animal experiments necessarily. There's, there's, sort, of a, there's sort of a gap. At some point, you start, stop testing principles and you start simulating what you're going to do in the trial. And I wonder if there's an opportunity for clinical trialists to teach some experimental methods to preclinical investigators, because I think there's a certain element of rigor, of a lot of the elements of rigor that you're talking about here, um, that, that clinical trial, that you know, for what we do that's bad in clinical trials, but that's what we do well is, is some of this rigor. Um, and how do we do that? I mean, how do we how do we make that happen? How do we uh, how do we make it happen? Yeah. I have to say, I'm not really like an expert in this whole big NIH um, plan for this, but just in reviewing the materials that just came out um, a few weeks ago about this, there appears as though there are plans, although it's not yet established, to have some sort of training modules so that people can get some online training about uh, more appropriate experimental methods at the, the animal. Yeah, I mean, I saw a grand opportunity to create those modules. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't wonder how we... I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, is it going to be something that, like, human subjects protection, they're now going to have, like, animal design training? I mean, I, I don't know, but that's the one thing that, that I'm aware of that um, is planned. But I agree with you. I mean, there's a lot that I think the preclinical animal model people can learn from experimental design. And unfortunately, I think there are probably many things that were done appropriately, but just material that's provided in the actual document, you just don't know because there's never been requirements to report all of that. Great. Thank you both very much.